A typical integrated circuit chip crosses more than 70 international borders before reaching consumers. So what happens when the United States tightens export controls and pushes for reshoring? Or the EU, after facing shortages during the pandemic, seeks to boost its self-sufficiency. And let's not forget China's chip ambitions as it expands its presence globally. It's no question that the global semiconductor supply chain is going through a transformation. But what does that look like? And where do ASEAN countries fit in as the giants grapple to secure and forge their own semiconductor industries. For this and more, we're joined by Chris Zeng Chi Hua from California. He's a non-resident fellow at the Research Institute for Democracy, Society and Emerging Technology, or DSET. And from Bangkok, we have Archanan Kopaibun, Associate Professor of Economics at Tamasat University, now also visiting senior fellow at ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Thank you both for being on the program, Chris. Let us talk about this complicated picture that is now emerging. What's your take on U.S. tariff policies and China's increased presence on Southeast Asia? Are we seeing a new, uh, let's say, globalization order or, or a fragmentation of globalization within the semiconductor industry, Chris? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, um, so I would say it's... Um, the, we can see the kind of effect. On the one hand, the, the use the, for the U.S. to use tariffs and also the export control to um, to kind of restructure the um, industry and also the kind of uh, economic cooperation from China with uh, increasingly with Southeast Asian countries, with Asian countries, and uh, um, to um, pursue the kind of um, uh, MOUs and other um, develop uh, kind of the commitment to um, joint ventures, developments. And uh, um, I would say that if we are thinking about the kind of the split into uh, US versus China kind of blocks, I would say it's not necessarily because for a lot of the Southeast Asian countries, um, they still have the kind of the kind of non-alignment commitment uh, uh, in between superpowers. Um, for the Asian countries um, to do so. For instance, for, Ma uh, for Malaysia, in, the, in April this year, um, uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping uh, went to Southeast Asian country, including Malaysia, to, uh, uh, for visits, and uh, they signed multiple MOUs afterwards. And, uh, but um, um, after that, we also see Malaysia is kind of um, doing like joint military drill with the U.S., and also they adopted um, the kind of export control on U.S. origin AI chips um, last month. So we kind of see that kind of a strategic hedging between the two superpowers. So, so if we think about that bilaterally, then they are kind of trying to strike up a deal with the two, uh, with China and U.S. Um, separately. But I would say that if we want actually want to see uh, or um, um, seeing the kind of the split between um, between countries and their um, different sides, then that would be the kind of unilateral controls uh, imposed by this kind of superpower. So either the U.S. or China, the U.S. and the actual control pushing countries to um, to set up their subsidiaries in uh, South Asian countries. Um, uh, we see China using their uh, raw min uh, minerals to do similar controls. So this kind of unilateral scene that would push uh, a lot of the emerging countries to think about um, which side I want to uh, ensure that my supplier relationship is uh, more uh, important. So we, we might see the kind of split on that front. Yeah, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there when you talked about the delicate balancing act. So Archanan, you know, uh, ASEAN leaders emphasize neutrality and centrality as part of their economic policy, particularly dealing with, uh, you know, the, these big giants that surround them and that control much of the global economy. How does that work now? Uh, Chris kind of outlined how, how they're playing it to a certain extent, but under Trump's current trade policies, is can they continue doing things that the way they've always had? For the beginning, I think at the current state, the semiconductor supply chain has been really deep rooted in the into the uh, East Asian many country in East Asian, including Northeast and Southeast Asian. So uh, of course uh, the current uh, uh, 
the 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 the, the current uh, tension between the U.S. and China would motivate the multinational enterprises to relocate the 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 production facility to some extent, and what we see in it, they did it conservatively, in the sense that they they instead of looking for the new location to set up their production facility, they they try to uh, use the existing facility that they have and expand, uh, try to rely less on China, but not completely uh, remove China out of the supply chain. It's very hard to decouple any country out of the supply chain right now. Yeah, d despite all these countries uh, having to navigate uh, the, the policy, the trade policies and perhaps others trade wars, uh, China is rapidly expanding its global footprint. Earlier this year, Chinese Premier Li Qiang outlined Beijing's position at the ASEAN GCC China Economic Forum in Kuala Lumpur. Take a listen. Chancellor 加强发展战略的对接，深化区域一体化合作，提升贸易和投资自由化、便利化水平，同时需要我们大家坚定维护以世界组世界贸易组织为核心的多边贸易体制。deeper integration, but at the same time, that, that's one of the points that the U.S. is, is clearly looking at. So they're cracking down on Southeast Asian transshipment. Now, firstly, Chris, can you explain how that works, especially in particularly with dealing with uh, China's supply chain? And where would you draw the line between legitimate multi-country production and what's called masking or illicit masking? Yeah, so um, I would say that transshipment has been like a very long uh, practice that firm would do. So um, in the kind of, in its more original meaning that it is just a kind of value adding process or you're shipping to other places so that you can add some kind uh, to be more uh, competitive in the global markets. But um, in nowadays, we see the kind of more and more uh, illicit kind of um, way to do trans transshipments means that it's not like outright legal, um, but there is um, the, like you said, the product, the, the, the kind of dilemma between value adding versus like uh, masking the origin. So, so my, um, my personal view would be that we kind of have to go back to the logic of like the value chain governance. So we have to look at how complex that um, that product or that supply chain is, and we have to look at the verification and the kind of availability in different places. So if we think about like um, um, sending chips to one country, to country A, and then to country B, and then go to the final destinations, do we really see that the country B has the kind of available um, value adding processes in those areas? Or if there is like, um, not adding that much um, value to that, then we can maybe deem that the, the, the kind of processes may, come, may become more illicit and the kind of fall into the kind of masking origins um, that uh, should be more uh, scrutinized. Arjun, and how much of that is going on uh, in particular in Southeast Asia? And how much will it affect n now that, you know, all these new trade policies are coming into place? The, these young industries we're seeing in Southeast Asia that have to survive and often work along with China because they are often the bigger cli biggest clients? Oh, of course, I think so. this is a very great question. Uh, I think so. uh, if we look at the data, the trade data uh, long enough and in detail, we will see that the, 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 the kind of 
township names that, that match the, the true origin of a product would happen uh, in few product in certain country, not in, in the really uh, uh, massive scale for the Southeast Asian economy. That is the first first point that I think that we need to be careful about that. And the second, and as uh, Chris mentioned, is about the value added that we add along the, the multiple production stage that we fragmented the whole production process and scatter all around the world. I think this need to be this is going to be a new challenge for all of us. And if we can draw the sensible line uh, sensible line, we can uh, we can uh, and then we can preserve the the uh, low base trade agreements and we can talk about this. I think so. Uh, in semiconductor or electronics, in in a broader sense, uh, they often cross border because of the the, the production technology is allowed. So uh, if if we want to prevent the the time shipment in the sense that they create very small value added, we need to take into account uh, the the certain uh, product uh, features in, in, into consideration as well. For example. We talk about printed circuit board. The printed circuit board, the bare printed circuit board, the one yet put any electronic device in there and the one put electronic device in there are at the same tariff subheading. But actually this process is totally different. This create a quiet value, but by nature of the product, the value added per product is very thin. It doesn't do any time shipment at all. This is just the measure of product fragmentation happening in electronic. So I think that we need to work together and, and that is that going to be really uh, challenging. Chris, Taiwan is pushing to build a non-China supply chain. Um, if Beijing's influence in Southeast Asia grows, is that is that possible or does it risk just sidelining an entire region? Like we mentioned before, that every country has this um, kind of developmental trajectories and uh, Taiwan's um, um, models might not be like necessarily a good thing for a lot of countries. And uh, um, also like deepening the kind of uh, connections between countries, um, we might see that Taiwanese firms uh, might be more um, um, thinking about like we need to like um, have like a Taiwan plus one uh, model setting up other subsidiaries in other places, um, which is um, kind of hurting Taiwan's like tech diplomacy in, in one sense. And also it might um, lead to more benefits for other countries, for Taiwanese firms, but uh, it might have like contradiction, contradictory um, goals with the kind of um, state policy and the kind of diplomatic um, um, policies for sure. Very, very complicated situation. Now, Archanan, you mentioned that over the next few years, there will be a reconfiguration of the global supply chain. Can you tell us where the ASEAN countries would fit into that and what that would mean for Taiwan? As all know that uh, the Southeast Asian economy has engaged into the semiconductor supply chain long ago. So uh, we are trusted production base. So in the situation that we are facing today, uh, the multinationals try to relocate it, try to handle the uncertainty, try to rely less uh, on China supply chain. And the best place there they can, can go is Southeast Asia. I think that is uh, number one. And, and we, can, we have seen that because uh, if you look at few years past, our, uh, the empirical analysis that I jointly work with my colleague at the Tamasa University show that 70% of greenfield direct investment from multinational enterprise in semiconductor go on to the same location. They expand on the existing affiliate in Southeast Asia. They are not trying to find the new location. <clears throat> Another 30%, they positively respond to the incentive by developed country and very small amount that try to find a new location. So that is the way that, that we have seen. And I think that this is a very good opportunity for Southeast Asian economy try to contribute 
try to buy time for all of us to see that we need to stay together because no single country can handle this kind of supply chain. And, and things like that, that, that would be very important. And on that note, we'll have to leave it there. We've just about run out of time. Thank you so much, Chris Zheng Chihua, for joining us from California and Archanan Kopai Boon from Bangkok.